Well, it's good to gather today and to worship the Lord. And thank you, worship team, for leading us as we worship the Lord through song. Well, I'm going to continue where I left off last week. And last week, we had, if you weren't here, we had a, a prayer time for Afghanistan and the things that are happening. Continue to pray for that situation there. Um, and so it went longer, so I shortened up part of the sermon. And um, so I'm going to continue. I'm going to just review, try to review. You know how pastors are. They try to review and they sometimes preach longer. I'm going to try not to preach as long. Um, but there's a lot I'd like to cover. And as your pastor, one of your pastors, my heart is to, to help you to bring clarity to life and to understanding God's word. Uh, I just know my own life for a lot of years after I became a Christian, I didn't, there's a lot I didn't understand and had struggled with. And uh, if it, at times still do because Satan tries to get us to believe lies. And uh, as I renew my mind with God's word and the truth, it, there brings clarity. And, and that's, that's our heart for all of you that you would just live a, a godly life, victorious for the Lord. So we are in the book of Second Peter chapter 2. I'm going to try to get through verses 1 through 10, and we are going to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. So if you'd like to prepare your hearts as uh, we get ready at the end of this uh, sermon, the deacons will come up and we'll celebrate uh, what Jesus said, uh, his body and his blood that was broken and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Aren't you, aren't you thankful for grace and mercy? I'm so thankful for that. So I won't review all this, but you know that the book was written to Christians who were being persecuted for their faith. I mean, even to the point of death, they were being tortured. Um, and then even Peter was, um, he died. Uh, they crucified him upside down um, after uh, Rome was burned and Nero blamed the Christians. So um, I'm going to go on here if I can get my clicker to work. There we go. Um, so uh, in first, Second Peter um, 1, 12, this is what he says. He says, so I will always remind you of these things. That's what he's telling us, uh, even though you know them. And he wants us to be uh, firmly established in the truth. He says, even though you are, uh, he wants you to continue. And that's for us as believers. We want you to continue to be f- um, firmly established in the truth. And so... So the first thing he says, if you have your Bibles or your phones, whatever you're looking at, uh, first, uh, second Peter chapter two, we're going to start with uh, verse one. And he, he starts out, but there will also be false prophets among, um, but they were, excuse me, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. So he's talking about there's going to be false teachers. And we have false teachers to, today uh, in our day. And this is important that we understand what's the truth and what's false. You need to know. In fact, I've told you this many, many years. I've been here 30 years now. Please go home, read the scriptures, make sure what we're teaching is right. Because the scripture is our guideline. It's our plumb line. And so we cannot teach anything that goes against the word of God. And so the first thing we looked at last week is that there will be, it says that he says they will secretly introduce uh, destructive heresies and uh, things that do not go with the word of God. And uh, in Jude, I didn't have this last week, but I want to bring it to you. In Jude, it's sort of like parallels Second Peter chapter 2. He says, for certain men, this is these false teachers, whose condemnation was written long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change, or the word can be pervert, the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as only sovereign and Lord. So that's what they were teaching then. And that's what's happening today. And so the word, uh, the, the teaching is Gnosticism. Have you ever heard of that before? It's, it's, it's really uh, prevalent today with even Christians who are teaching it. it. Basically, it's a false teaching that anything I do in this body does not affect my soul. And that's a false teaching. In fact, in, in I would say most of our counseling that we have done as elders and pastors and our pastor's wives, 
It, they're soulish issues that we're dealing with, emotions and things that trauma or, or, or sins that we've committed or someone has done something to us. And it affects our, our, our soul, our, our, our feelings. And, and thank the Lord, he's the one who brings healing. He's, there's grace and there's mercy. And we want you to have that. But if you have a wrong thinking, you'll be stuck in the cycle of bitterness or unforgiveness and you'll, uh, you'll be angry all the time. And have you ever met anyone that's just, they're just angry at, at the world? Don't look at them, okay? I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't want you to be that kind of person. Listen, things will happen in this world, won't they? So how are we going to handle? Are we going to become bitter or are we going to become better? What are we going to do? Are we going to let the, the Lord take it and use it in our life? Or are we just going to become so bitter that people don't like to be around us? Like we're baptized in vinegar or something, you know. <laughs> and so, so this false teaching leads to all kinds of immorality and disbelief. And, and, and the danger of following this false teaching is that we're guilty of the same sin and judgment. And so we want to be careful not to follow in that way. And so the second thing, and I talked about this last week, so some of these things I'm not going to go into detail, but you can go back and listen to the sermon online uh, from last week, but they deny that Jesus is sovereign. And we talked about what does sovereign mean? It means that he's all powerful without limits. He he's, uh, has absolute dominion. We talked about how he limited himself when he came on the earth as a man, but he's now at the right hand of the father and he intercedes for you and I. And he is all powerful. He has all dominion. And then in Samuel it talks about how God alone is sovereign and then has Jesus sovereign. That's why we believe that Jesus is God. And so there, I won't go again to, into detail there. The third thing we talked about being aware of false teachers is that they will be judged. They'll bring, bring swift destruction on themselves. And there's something about this. Um, Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you recognize them. And I showed you this picture. of Look at that picture there. <laughs> You see that? You see the false one there? Looks sort of like a sheep, okay? And that's why we need to know the Word of God, to be careful we don't get sucked in to false teaching. So, we'll move on. Paul, even when he was leaving um, the, the Ephesians, and um, he brought the elders in, and he gave them this whole, uh, basically in a sermon, but he says, a savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. And he says, that's why we have elders and leaders who are supposed to protect the flock. You know, one of the things, one of the biggest things for pastors and elders is the reason is to bring, um, to being, uh, to expose false teaching. Because there's so much out there, especially with the internet today. It, it amazes me. <laughs> it amazed me as I was researching false teachers and false prophets, how people are like saying, well, no, this person is and that person is. And there's lots of them. But you have to compare it to the word of God. And so we're going to actually I'm going to show you a few. There were so many. I thought, well, I can't expose them all. But if you have a question on someone or some teaching, please come to us and we'll look at scripture with you. We'll help you as we are learning. So there's lots of them to come in sheep's clothing but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. It says, by, your, by their fruit, by the way they live, you will be able to recognize them. And so last week I said, here's four things that the scripture says in Peter that you can recognize them. The first one, they're popular. They're famous, okay? Many will follow their shameful ways. And uh, it's, it's, they're pretty much almost like Hollywood movie stars, some of them. Um, and it's like a business they run. And uh, it just amazes me. The second thing, they're blasphemers. Uh, they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. That word there is blaspheming. Uh, which basically what they do is they take what is right from God's word and they, they say it's wrong and they turn things around. So they switch right from wrong and wrong from right, calling what God disapproves of right. And that is huge 
in the day we live in today. In Romans, it says this, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve created things rather than the creator. And who is forever praised? Amen. So this is what's happening to our day. People are very confused today, especially young people. Um, the things that they see on the media, they're taught in schools. They're very confused. It, my heart grieves as I've been watching some of the things on the news and some of the things I see young people um, believing. And of course, Isaiah, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And there's more there. But basically, that's what he's saying. The third thing is they're greedy um, in their teaching and they exploit, they will exploit people. And of course, this is happening today. And in, fa in fact, in Corinthians, Paul says these kind of false teachers, they peddle the gospel for profit. And it's, it's all about the money. And it's okay, Corinthians, it says in uh, Corinthians 9, he says it's okay for elders and pastors to make a living just like those in the temple. But it's amaz it amazes me um, how a lot of ministries, a lot of churches, it's just like another business. It's sad, but that's what we're facing today. Of course, I talked about Jesus. Uh, he, the, that was what was happening in his day with the temple. You remember he cleared the temple twice. <laughs> the first time it, they were selling and buying and then sheep and doves. And, and he actually had a righteous anger. Do you remember Jesus did that? He went and he took a whip, okay? And he drove the cattle out. He drove those who were uh, trying to make the temple a business. And he turned over the tables and he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market or a house of business? And then the second time is in Matthew. He says, he does the same thing. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. And so this is what concerns me today because there's a lot of churches that are doing things that I would say it's, it, it, you can't recognize the difference between a, is it really a church or is it a business? Um, it, it, it concerns me and it should concern you too. The fourth thing is they're liars, okay? They, they have stories that they make up. And so here's what I want to talk about. A false teacher will take a little element of scripture or truth and then they'll twist it. Okay. And I want to give you an example. You remember when Jesus was in the desert and he was tempted by the devil? Satan came to him and he did the same thing. He took a little bit of scripture and he tempted Jesus and he twisted it. So let me read this for you. In fact, you might want to turn there if you have your Bibles. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, it says that the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, look at he says, if, if you're the son of God, he says, throw yourself down for it is written. Here he is. He's quoting some scripture. He's quoting Psalms 91. How did Jesus respond? He responds with the truth of God's word in Deuteronomy. It is also written, okay, do not put your, the Lord your God to the test. So when you're coming against some wrong thoughts in your mind, when people are saying wrong things, how do you handle it? It might sound good. In fact, it, it has maybe even an element of truth. But you've got to go back to the truth of God's word. And the truth of God's word will always set you. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, when you know the truth, the truth will what? Come on, help me out. The truth will set you free. And so that's as I've been growing in the Lord over the years and I've been struggling or depressed or I didn't understand what it was to live for God. And I started reading scripture and like, like what God just speaks to you and says, wow, Lord, I didn't understand that about who you are and how you wanted me to live. Forgive me. I, and just like that, there's like a freedom 
depression has left. Because when you start to understand who you are, when you understand the grace of God. In fact, grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness, it says. So when you learn, I don't want to live that way. God has a certain design for me to live. It actually frees you from the guilt and shame because God doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to live free, free in Christ. So I'm going to expose at least four I would call false teachers, and I'll show you what, why. Okay, uh, Joseph Prince, he's, he's well-known. In fact, people, one time a person in our church uh, brought a book, and they said, would you read this? And I actually read some of it, and some of the same things he had in that other book. So uh, Destin uh, Terrain, uh, let me show you what he says. Okay, my friends, God does not require you to search your heart and locate your sins before you can worship. And he goes on in page 189, stop examining yourself and searching your heart for sin. Now this might sound good, because Jesus did die for our sins, didn't he? But what's the scripture say? Well, let's read the scripture. In Corinthians, the people were living in sin. And they were, it was so, so bad, there was uh, immorality, there were people getting drunk, and all the stuff that took place, Paul had to write and said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail, fail the test of your faith is believing. And so he warns them to examine themselves. And also, we're going to look at this last one uh, later on at the very end of the sermon. It's, it's when you take the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. He says, examine yourselves because they were living so immoral and he says, and he says, examine to see uh, before you come and take communion. It, he says, that's why some have fallen asleep and gotten sick and some have died. It, actually, the word fallen asleep has died. And we'll look at that in a little bit. So what he says here is, is false. It's a false teaching. And so we need to understand that. The second one is Joel Osteen. OK, your best life now. And a lot of people follow him. He's, he's a prosperity teacher. OK. So what they'll do is they'll take just an element of teaching because God wants you to prosper, does he not? He does, okay? Is God's will for you to live a prosperous, uh, live in prosperity instead of poverty? Well, let me read um, Paul, what he said in, in Philippians 4, uh, uh, thir 11 through 13. I've learned, look what he says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. This is something that we have to come to no matter what we face, we've got to learn. It's not something that comes natural, okay? He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. By the way, we use that verse a lot of times out of context, He's talking about um, the things he needed and so forth there. So here's the point. Can I say this? I've said it before. God wants you to be rich. But be careful not to settle for money. You understand that? Is there anything wrong with money? There's nothing wrong with money. In fact, there's a lot of godly rich people. That's not the point. The point is that becomes their God. That's their whole life. And that's the problem with the prosperity teachers. There's a lot more we could say, but they're basically saying, in fact, I heard one that says, God wants you to have seven houses just like me. Okay? I, literally, my wife and I uh, watched that on TV when in Arizona on a vacation. And we twist the word of God sometimes. Well, do you know that Paul was beaten? He was flogged? <laughs> shipwrecked twice. Okay, I mean, he went through a lot because of believing in Jesus. And so there's a wrong teaching there. The reason why I bring this up is because you and I will go through some tough times. If you haven't, you will someday. <laughs> and you got to learn how you're going to handle that because you think this is the way God is and he's a just God, he's almighty. And by the way, this world is not our home. And I want you to be prepared for eternity. I do want you to live victoriously here on earth. And I want you to have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. 
So here's another one. Uh, and when it, the same thing is uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be careful if you think that I want to be rich. Okay, Kenneth Copeland. Okay, uh, Laws of Prosperity. He has a book. This is what he says, and he's really big. If you send money, you'll get money come, will come back. God will bless you. And there's a lot there with him. Uh, he says this, uh, do you want a hundredfold return on your money? He says, give and let God multiply it back to you. No bank in the world offers that kind of return. Praise the Lord is what he says. So if you follow him, in fact, I'll just be very blunt with you. Uh, a couple of these preachers, I have actually counseled people and they disagreed with me and their life has really come to ruin because of it. OK, some of them are healing uh, and I believe in healing, by the way. In fact, I was talking to some of the elders about this. We believe in healings and we have seen healings. And but and so be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. OK, anybody heard that saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater? Okay, when you're giving the baby a bath, the water's dirty and you don't throw, they used to throw it out the window. Kind of thing. By the way, that's a, that's a German, Dan, I don't know if you know that, that's a German uh, uh, proverb. Did you know that? I looked it up. So I, see, look it. <laughs> I got Dan on one thing here. He always, he, so it's a German proverb. I looked it up in several places that that's don't throw the baby out with the bath water. So I, I finally taught Dan something. <laughs> uh, I just looked it up this morning, by the way. <laughs> uh, here's, the, here's the verse in 2 Timothy. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love, the love, there's the love of money, is the root of all kinds of evil. Um, I just have to tell you, over the years, uh, at least two to three people, we've had to counsel with gambling addictions to where they were even hearing voices. And uh, uh, this is back when Reverend Seeker, I don't know if you remember, this was back in uh, when uh, we were pastoring together. There was a gentleman whose wife, he wasn't bringing home the paycheck and found out he was having a gambling addiction back then and he, it, it, they weren't paying the bills and um, it brings destruction. Um, and so these are people, they, they're just wanting to get rich. They want to win the lottery. They, wanna, they think that's going to bring them happiness. And it, in fact, it doesn't. If you, after you, you've read, you read about studies of people who have won the lottery, and within a few years, they file bankruptcy. Andrew uh, Womack, um, the scripture does not say, look what he says here. The scripture um, the scripture. Don't tell us to pray for the sick. Is that true? This is what is quote from him. Well, James says, if anyone is sick, let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. He also says this. It isn't God who decides who gets healed or who doesn't. Is that true? Well, Psalms 103, it says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, forget not his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. It's him that does that. So what, what happens is these, these people, they take an element of truth and they twist it, and then they have all these following and people, and then they end up dis, being disappointed because they, maybe some of them have not been healed. And then they think, well, I don't have enough faith. Or I don't have enough money because only those who have enough money can be forgiven and, and uh, things like that. So you have to be careful of false teachers. So this is where I left off uh, last week. The scripture says there's going to be a judgment on false teachers and those who uh, preach. By the way, I said this last week. Um, we as elders and shepherds, the scripture says there'll be a higher judgment because we can lead people astray. And that's why I try, we try our best to rightly divide the word of God and uh, to teach the word of God. And if there's been something that we maybe misspoken, I'm okay to say, hey, I was wrong. And there's been some times I've had to come back and say, no, I was wrong on this. And it's okay. I'm, I don't claim to be perfect and, and know it all. So, so let me read this. The, the first thing he talks about, this judgment on fallen Angels. He gives an example. 
And there's a lot to study on this, so I can't go through it all. If you would like to know more, we can get together and, and talk and go through these passages. He says, Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, he says, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. For some reason, there are some angels or angelic beings that are in chains, in dungeons, and there's some that are not. And some people cannot explain it, and I'm not going to try to explain it all. But there are angelic beings that we believe are demonic in Scripture, and we've, as elders, we have helped people to be set free from uh, sinful life or demonic uh, strongholds. And so in Matthew 25, 41, uh, Jesus talks about, let me just read this. Then he will say to those, this is on the judgment day, those on his left, depart from me, uh, you who are cursed into the flame, the eternal flame prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell in the, in the, in the, the beginning was prepared for the devil and his angels. Angels are messengers, by the way. Uh, it can be translated messengers. And so I don't, hell was not prepared for us um, until the fall happened. And so in Genesis, he's talking about um, these angels. Let me read this for you. Uh, this is where, where Noah and coming into the flood. Uh, this is in Genesis 6. It says, The Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is corrupt. The Nephilim, this word, these, we believe that they were like spiritual beings or uh, created beings, were on earth in those days and afterwards when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children with them. So this is also in the Jewish books, where we're not canonized, but they have uh, what they call sacred books, uh, which Enoch, this is also recorded there. And it's interesting to read history on some of those things, so I'd encourage you to. The second thing is judgment for false teachers, um, the ungodly people in Noah's day. We already talked about it. He was talking about the angels, but I want to give you a little bit more. He says in verse 5 of back to 2 Peter chapter 2, If he did not spare the ancient world when, they, when he brought the flood on the ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness. We're going to come back to that here in a little bit. He was a preacher of righteousness and seven others. Basically, God spared his family from the flood. And you could go read more about it in Genesis, but let me just bring this point out. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become in, on earth. Look at this. He says that every inclination of thoughts of the human's hearts, look, it was only evil all the time. Wow. Wow. And look what it says, the Lord regretted that he made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the Lord's heart is troubled at what's happening in our day today? I believe. I know that there's godly people. Okay. And I thank the Lord. Um, and, and I don't think that we're at that place yet. But we're going toward that place. We're moving that way. And I pray, Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith on earth? I pray he will. I pray he'll find a, a lot of godly people that are waiting for his return. And I pray you are. And that's why I want to encourage you this. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Stand strong, stand firm. Because in this day, there's going to be false teaching. Say, the false teachers always said, it's okay, you can live that way. That won't harm you. But the true teachers would say, no, don't do that. You know, when they, when they advise the kings, I wouldn't go to war because you're living in sin. You'll be defeated. And the false prophets to the kings would say, oh, you'll be fine. And then they would be defeated because the Lord wasn't with them. I'm going to move on. The third thing, he talks about the ungodly people in Lot's days. And, then I, and there, there's a lot uh, I want to talk about here, but we just don't have time, so I won't go into great detail, but I want to explain this to you. He goes on in verse 6 through 8 of 2 Peter chapter 2. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
by burning them in ashes and made them example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. If he rescued Lot, a righteous man, there's that, I was talking, I was going to talk about that, who was distressed by the filth, look at this, say, filthy lives and lawless men for, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tortured or tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Let me, there's going to be a judgment someday and thank the Lord, no matter what we've done in the past, I don't care what sin, there's grace and mercy. Aren't you thankful for that? But if we continue to live that way, Scripture says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's in Galatians. And so a false teacher will say, you can go ahead and live any way you want. But the thing is, we will stand before God. And I thank the Lord. He's the just judge and I'm not the one judging you and you're not the one judging me. So be careful to not judge (laughs) in that way. Okay. But I was reading this and I was thinking, Lord, does it concern my soul, the things that I see happening in our world today? Does it concern? It should. I just have to be honest. I think I've become so numb to the things I see. We become so numb the things we've heard. And with the things we watch and the, the filthiness of, of people's cursing. And I, I know that grieves God. And it should not be for um, coming out of his, his people's mouths. And I was praying, Lord, let me have that same kind of concern in my soul and a love for those who are lost. When Jesus looked over Jerusalem, he, he wept because they were sheep without a shepherd. They were just being led astray to the slaughter. And I see that happening today, that there's so many people who are lost, they're depressed, they have no hope, and they don't know the truth. And I remember what it was like living that way in the life I came out of. And when someone told me their testimony, which was Rob Gates, who was a pothead, by the way, (laughs) He had planned to kill me, and you know the story. And I came out of that, and he was brave enough to say, this is what God did in my life, and this is how he changed me, and he could do the same thing to you because he loves you, and he wants you to turn and repent from that way, and he has a better life for you, and it's not your best life now. (laughs) In fact, I would say... What does happen a lot of times when we turn to follow Christ, the enemy doesn't like us and we're like button heads. In fact, I can tell you, after I decided to not live the way I I decided I used to live with immorality and some of the partying, I had friends who came to me and I had family members, by the way, came to me and made fun of me. And some still do. No one says it's going to be easy road. Okay, but you still love, you still love them. And you know that they need the truth just like you need the truth. And so your whole attitude of how you present the gospel is so important. And um, sometimes we come across like we're angry at them. Be angry at the enemy. (laughs) But do they know you really care and love them? And so it's important that we understand so in Jude 1, it describes this. There, there's all these scriptures. You can go look them, look them up later online. Go look them or come to me and I'll help you out. But in a similar way, Jude says Sodom and Gomorrah was uh, in the surrounding towns gave them over, gave up to sexual immorality and perversion. It got so bad. Um, uh, they serve as an example uh, of those who will suffer the punishment of eternity. The Bible does say someday God will destroy the earth, not by a flood, but it'll be burned up and there'll be a new heaven and there'll be a new earth and the old order will pass away. No more crying, no more death, no more pain. And he'll make all things new. We won't have to deal with this someday. And I thank the Lord for the promise of that word. 
of his word and truth. Um, uh, they called to Lot. This is in Sodom before it was burned. Um, there were men that came out. At, uh, excuse me, let me read this for you. It says, they called to Lot. This is when the angels came in and they were going to destroy Sodom. Okay. Uh, where are the men that came to you tonight? See, Lot had brought the angels into the, the home. And uh, they said, bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. And then in verse 24, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah uh, from the Lord out of the heavens. In fact, if you want to go look at the studies of, of where, you know where the, where, where the area where this was at is where the Dead Sea is. And actually they mine salt there. Did you know that? So the Lord sent down raining sulfur. So go read the history and geographically, it's interesting if you go read that. Let me show you something. Uh, a lot of people will say that the, the sin of, of Sodom was, uh, was the uh, immorality and the sexual sins, which it was. But if you read in Ezekiel, it says it didn't start out that way. And there's like a spiral. It can happen in our life, and I actually see it happening in the U.S. It's happening in our world. Let me read this for you. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, that's the cities around became, what's the word, arrogant there? Prideful. Uh, that's the number one thing, is be careful. Pride leads to, leads to destruction, okay? So they started off being very prideful. And they became overfed <laughs> and unconcerned. Look at this, unconcerned, they didn't help the poor, okay? And the needy. Okay, we need to be careful, that we don't become prideful. We're overfed, I know that. I know I am, okay? Okay, and are we concerned about the poor and needy? This is important. They were haughty. Uh, man, I, I should have looked at the word haughty, but it's just like they didn't think they could be touched and they would make fun of people. And they did detestable things before me, the Lord says. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. So this is spiral thing. So I want to be careful for us individually. But that, he's talking about nations and cities. Are there cities today that are going this way? Oh, we, can, we can name them. There is corrupt cities today. And I've told you this before. But back in 1976, when I went through Las Vegas, I was not a believer. But boy, I tell you, there was prostitution. There was immorality. I went to some of the shows, by the way. My mom's probably watching online. Mom, you didn't hear that. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, and it's worse today because it's legal. And uh, my, the sad thing is, most women, as little girls, didn't grow up thinking they're going to be a prostitute. They don't want to. It's a sad thing. So when I, when I see people in those situations, my heart grieves because that was a little girl someday. She didn't think that she had to live that lifestyle. That's not the lifestyle God had planned. And sex trafficking, it's just become terrible. And it should grieve us. Well, the last thing I want to look at, and then we're going to share in communion and see how I'm doing on time. Oh, man, I'm doing good. I can go another. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> the last thing I want to look at is he says, uh, ungodly people in our day, he says, if this is, how, is so that happened in the past, then the Lord knows how to rescue. He's talking about a uh, lot there. Rescue the godly from trial. So he rescued uh, Noah. He rescued Lot. Do you believe God can rescue us? He can, and he will. And it, it may not be in the way that we think, but I, in fact, uh, you know, righteous people do die, okay? But for the believer, it says, blessed are the saints who die in the Lord both now, from now on. We think death can be bad, but it actually can be a good thing. Actually, I was talking to Amy Asher about her mom just passing away, and that's the view she's looking at from eternity. It's important that we as believers look at the right view, the right lenses, Okay? So, but God wants us to live that godly life. But he says, 
He says, and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authority. So it's those who continue to do that, continue. Um, I thank the Lord as believers, as we say, Lord, forgive me for uh, living this life. There's grace and mercy. And we don't have to be afraid of the judgment because we've all sinned. And we need grace and mercy. So, 1 John says this, no matter where you're at, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our, our sins. Excuse me, faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all, all unrighteousness. Aren't you thankful for that? Okay, so we're going to take time for communion this morning. And I want to explain something to you as we look at the scripture on communion. And I want, I'm hoping this will be something that maybe you, for some of you the first time it may help you. But let me read this. This is in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 22 through 32. But Paul is saying, For I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. Look what he says. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. Okay, this represents his body. He took the bread. And when he had gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you have to understand that they were celebrating what was called the Passover. The Passover lamb, the, the lamb's body, uh, uh, his, the, it was, he was broken. The sacrifice, the blood was over the, do, the doorpost and the death angel would come by and pass over them. That was in Egypt. Remember that? And so they're celebrating it. Now, Jesus said, my body, which was broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then he goes on. He says, in the same way after supper. So they were having a whole meal celebrating the Passover. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it or drink it in remembrance of me. Whoever drinks Look what it says, whoever eats the bread and drinks this cup, you proclaim the, the Lord's death until he comes. So basically, he said, remember that my body and my blood was shed for your forgiveness of your sins. And so it's important when we come to, to remember that we're going to have communion. And everyone's welcome who's believers. You're welcome to, to come and participate. And the deacons will come up in just a minute and they'll give you... Um, guidelines to follow what, what to do with the elements. But it doesn't stop there. Here's what I wanted you to see. Look at the next verse. He says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So when we come and we take the elements, we remember the real reason he said, just don't do it flippantly. Examine yourself. Okay. Let's look what he says. Everyone, look what he says. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So, you remember the false teacher said, you don't have to examine yourself? <laughs> He's saying in scripture, Paul says, yes, you better examine yourself. Because remember what they were doing in that church and in, in that area? They were very sinful. It was very immoral. And they were getting drunk. They were coming to some of these feasts drunk. And he said, no, it's wrong. But I want you to see a little bit more here and then we'll have communion. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Look what he says. That is why many of you are weak and sick and a number have fallen asleep. Wow. Have you ever thought of that? that our sin can affect us physically if we don't take care of it. And I can just tell you some, some illustrations of my own life and others that we have helped. When they, not every sickness is a sin, okay? <laughs> Please don't go out of here and say every sickness is a sin. But there are some that we would say, and we've helped people, actually healing has taken, some healings have taken place when people have confessed their sins 
and renounce the ways they have lived. He says this, let me go on. But if you were to judge ourselves, so we're supposed to judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we will, it says we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So that judgment is though we won't go to hell. And so you and I, I can't judge you, you can't judge me, but we have to judge ourselves. So we're going to take some time for examining ourselves quietly, just between you and the Lord. You can bow your head and take time. If there's things that you know, take care of it in your seat there. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. And then you'll be prepared and recognize his body, his blood that was shed for us. Amen? I thank the Lord for that grace and mercy. So I'd like you to bow your heads and then the deacons will come forward at, after a few minutes here to take some time to uh, remember what the Lord has done. <laughs>